A good Monday morning to you, and thanks for tuning in to Real Talk. Maybe it's Monday afternoon, Monday evening. Whenever you're catching the show, we appreciate you being here with us. Hope you had a great weekend. Uh, Depending on where you were, uh, if you were in western Canada, you're probably experiencing some of the smoke from these BC wildfires uh, making your way through that. And, of course, uh, we know that we have listeners and viewers from from many different jurisdictions. We always love hearing from you, uh, finding out what you've been up to, what your weekend look like, what's on your mind, what's grinding your gears this morning, what's inspiring you. Positive Reflections is coming up a little bit later on in this show, uh, along with the details on how you could win a big solar install. That's right, getting your home or maybe your workplace to a net zero status. Details coming up on that later on the show. Right now, a reminder that each and every show that we do is presented proudly by our sponsors at Bitcoin Well. Spent the weekend talking to a couple of visitors, had the boys up from Calgary. They're both, you know, well, at least one of them in particular, huge into crypto. Pays close attention to all these developments. He's like, next time you talk to Adam O'Brien from Bitcoin Well, you should ask him this. You should talk to him about this. We were digging into it, getting the details. If you're intrigued by the world of crypto, you want to go to a trusted source where you can ask your questions, You'll find the Bitcoin well and the contact information for that group proudly headquartered out of Edmonton under the Sponsors tab at RyanJesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Coming up in about 10 minutes' time, we're going to talk to a uh, veterinarian and a researcher, a veterinary scientist out of the University of Calgary. We're going to learn a bit. How how much have you heard about chronic wasting disease? If you're a hunter or or if you're, uh, you know, keen on the outdoors, you've probably heard about it, but soon to be published research, new research is raising new fears about whether or not the illness could infect humans. And our expert guest, I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but on the record so far, the implications are the answer could be yes. So it's something that could be relevant to a whole bunch of people. That's coming up in about 10 minutes time. And in about an hour from now, we're going to talk to author and a researcher, Dr. Karen Messing. Uh, we're going to talk about occupational health in the context of gender and why women are in some circumstances more at risk in the workplace. Of course, the editorial producer of this show is Sarah Hoyles. How are you I doing? I you say, the editorial producer on the show is a woman. Is a woman. woman named Sarah. <laughs> and therefore, at risk. Uh, no, but what what, uh, what what put this on your radar? There's a, a new book out, right? Mm, yeah. uh, well, I guess at least earlier this year, uh, published back in April, uh, Bent Out of Shape, mm-hmm. Shame, Solidarity, and Women's Bodies at Work. Yeah, and I think the thing that really just kind of like made my eyes pop was the idea that PPE, so personal protective equipment around COVID, not designed for women. Hmm. So it's designed, I mean, it's just like cars are designed for men and... Cars are? Yeah. So actually safety ratings on cars are designed around uh, the male body. Ah. So women, not as safe in the old care. Interesting. So this is why we need more young girls and tweens and teens and young adults getting interested in STEM careers. Yeah. What is that? Science, tech, engineering, and math, right? That's it. And it. Uh, And so you, you want to make sure that you have women designing uh, crash testing and vehicles so finally... Finally, they can be better represented in these types. This is why it's important. Representation matters, right? Absolutely. We just solved the world's problems in 10 seconds. Look at us. Okay, well, let's wrap the show. Let's wrap the show. We're good. Our work here is done. I mean, I think it's, yes, it's important to have women in those fields, but just the idea of of having, uh, you know, the the thought that, oh, right, there are other people yeah, <laughs> that use these things called cars. That or... are not us or that don't look like us or that don't experience life like us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a great conversation to have. I'm looking forward to it. And there's a lot to catch up on as well. 
uh, depending on where you are. I think the Olympics are kind of sneaking up on everybody. I, it's, it feels a little bit strange. <laughs> I don't know. What are you laughing at? Are you a big Olympics fan? Are you a big Olympics person? Oh, no. No. Are you excited about the Olympics when it comes around to, to at least see the world gather and the best athletes, uh, you know, on the planet compete? And no, no, I I see the Olympics as a huge waste of money. Wow. How come? Well, I, I think about like how many sports events are there. There are the worlds for basically every sport. Yeah. And uh I know that it's a huge economic driver for the country that hosts. So I, I get it. And I feel like, you know, the wheels are already turning. You can't you can't change it. It's people are like, no, we can't cancel the Olympics. Um, I just look at the travel, the amount of money spent. And I mean, now within the context of covid, I think it just highlights that it's ridiculous. Okay. I think it's I think the Olympics should not happen like ever or just because of covid. No, ever. You I just think you just cancel the Olympics. Just fold the tent. I would not. It's I refuse to use. I, well, exactly. The I, like well, I know the, that the, I, the IOC <laughs> is like the IOC is one people. of the more powerful organizations on the planet. Yeah, people feel uh, people feel strongly about the Olympic Games. Um, when you say they're a huge economic driver for the host countries, that is true, but they also ha- come with a huge cost. Like the infrastructure oh, yeah. budget on these, and oftentimes, if you if you look back on some of the Olympic games that have really lost large amounts of money, like I think Sochi is one of them, for example. Mm. Um, you know, you 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 look and you kind of go like, is is this really worth it? Is it really worth it for the countries? And then how do you define worth it? Yeah, exactly. Right, because like you know, for example, when when Calgary hosted the Winter Olympic Games in 1988. That was a big deal for that city. It kind of gave it, it you know, the, the, the Olympic Games at that time, in a sense, put Calgary on the map, you know, and uh, in, in a lot of different contexts, it seems to give credibility. So you, you, you know the names of, of places that you may not otherwise know. Like I think of Lillehammer, Norway, <laughs> like who would know about Lillehammer? No offense. It's a fabulous place. But it was the Olympic Games that probably, you know, reiterated um, you know, sort of what a destination that could be for people. You wonder what the spinoff would be. Like, does the infrastructure, Vancouver might be another example where they have their, you know, their transit, the Canada line that was the train that, that now runs from, from Vancouver's International Airport all the way to downtown. That's one example, or the expansion of the Sea to Sky Highway, the widening of that highway up to Whistler, you know, that was, that was, uh, that was obviously a, a, an extremely dangerous highway, uh, that, that it was the equivalent of of uh, in Alberta the highway up in and out of Fort McMurray, mm. where people would say this this you know uh, lawmakers or or politicians need to take this more seriously these these fatalities on these highways and they need to twin the highways. Well, sometimes, as is the case with the Sea to Sky, along with the Olympic Games comes the impetus and the green light to spend whatever you need to spend, whether it's a billion dollars or six hundred million dollars on that highway project or or to build that research and training center or to build, you know, in Calgary, the, the, the athletes village and then the media village, which then became condos, which, how you know, helped address sort of a bit of a housing uh, shortage there, you know, within a certain price point. So lots of different examples of what the Olympics can accomplish. I, you know, I, I guess Olympics, I can take them or leave them. I always I always sort of find, you know, for me, from a purely selfish perspective, I care more about the Winter Olympic Games if it's just a big uh, hockey tournament with with all the best <laughs> national hockey leaguers in the world all playing at the Olympics, and I love to watch it. Um, you could probably make the argument though that it's the true amateurs that show up, like not the pros making eight million bucks a year, but the amateurs that show up, their chance to shine. That's that's hugely meaningful. Um, it's going to be different this year, obviously, with no fans in the stands. Yeah. I was saying to my buddies yesterday, I said, think of how much money they're going to lose on the gate, like on tickets and everything. And, and my pal says, yeah, but also think of how much they'll probably save on things like security. Like it's obviously still got to be locked down and secure, but you're not going to have as much security. That's one example of maybe where they'll save money. But eh, it'll be interesting to see. I feel like it's really been flying into the radar. Well... I mean, it's kind of scary to put the spotlight over there because, I mean, we're looking at how um, how we've got cases already showing up in the Athletes' Village. Yeah, and, with COVID, yeah. And so it's, 
I don't know. I, I also feel like Japan was like, we got to pull the shoot. Like, we got, we have to run this thing. We can't pause it another year. We've already lost how much money? They Let's already just... delayed it a year, right? Yeah, they already delayed it a year because it was supposed to be last summer. Right. right. So I think they're just kind of like, let's get like, let's get her done. Yeah, let's... it feels like it's really sneaking up on people. So so that's on our radar. We'll, we'll obviously, we're going we're gonna to do some cool things around the Olympics, and we'll find unique and compelling story angles on that. Um, I want to talk, I mean, this week, we're, we're, we're going to talk about drought. We're going to talk about what agricultural producers are encountering. We're seeing some photos on social media of the of the people, the men and women that feed us. You know, these these farmers that are saying, here's a photo of us, you know, last year. And here's a photo of us in the exact same spot this year. And you see it's it's it, these are drought light conditions and it's a big deal. So that's a story that we're following. How do you ignore what's going on with the federal Green Party right now? Annemi Paul is just being dragged by her party. It feels like it started these, I hope, are standalone and isolated incidents, but it feels like it started <laughs> right right around the time she was on Real Talk. And I, I'm kidding in a way, but it was basically days after she was, was on with us that things started to go sideways. And as an interviewer, I'm going, man, oh, man. I mean, I, I, I don't wish this on anybody, but I kind of wish it would have <laughs> happened before we had her so we could ask her about it. But then you also know she would have pulled shoot on the interview if this was happening. There's no way she would have come on the show. So um, that's a story that we're paying attention to. And then, of course, there, there are some developments when it comes to provincial politics in Alberta. The Calgary Stampede wrapping up last night. I know that this was probably one of the more inspiring Calgary Stampedes of all time and probably the most divisive Calgary Stampede of all time inspiring. at the same time. Oh, sure. The stampede, so? the stampede represents so much. To Calgarians, and for that matter, to Albertans, I think. But but you you look back to to when you know, I think it was twenty thirteen, right? When the entire province was, that's not true. But the southern part of the province was was still underwater. You know, they were still pumping out the Saddle Dome because there was water up to nine rows of the lower bowl or whatever it was, and houses were still not still, but houses had been floating down the river and we had seen these dramatic images and, and Bragg Creek and High River and, and all of these communities were, I mean, you know, South, Cal I mean, you look at maybe downtown Calgary, but I think of even some of my relatives, homes were, were destroyed by these floods and the hell or high water theme, the Calgary Stampede, it was so important to them. It was so important to organizers that they hold the stampede that they not cancel it because it said something. It communicated something and it was inspiring to people and it reminded people that this is a community that has faced adversity in past and will face adversity again. That's kind of the idea. And that's one of the reasons, obviously, one of the reasons why it was so important, I think, politically, why it was a political priority for Alberta's premier to make sure that the stampede happened. So it says a lot to people. The Calgary stampede was, was, was the return I mean, I'm, 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 if you're only listening on the podcast, and you don't see my face when I say this. When I say the Calgary Stampede was the return to normal. Um, obviously, nothing's hmm. normal again, and it's probably a little early to declare a return, but to have thousands of people gathering, to have musicians playing again, to have meetings happening again, people mixing and mingling, to have... Um, you know, versions of pancake breakfasts and parties and gatherings for a lot of people, July 1st and the lifting of the mask mandates in most municipalities and the reopening of the province of Alberta and the fact that the Calgary stampede happened uh, after last year, the stampede lost 25 million bucks last year. It was canceled. It was a big deal for a lot of people after last year. I think it was really important. It was big. And I think that it, while it really pissed a lot of people off, I think it also really encouraged a lot of people. And uh, the Stampede was used as a bit of a political football this year. At the same time, uh, for all intents and purposes, I mean, let's wait two weeks to see what everything looks like with regards mm -hmm. to numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, but for all intents and purposes, I would think early on, um, they would declare it a success. Attendance was and down for obvious reasons. <laughs> and that's okay. I mean, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to take a big steaming pile on the Calgary Stampede. I, I have been a fan of the Calgary Stampede ever since I was a kid. And uh, I've talked about that on the show before. It's why I don't uh, appreciate the Stampede being co-opted politically. And it's yeah. also why I'll, I'll probably at, at some times jump to its defense. I just found it really eerie, um, as I'm sure many Albertans did this, this weekend. Um, just the smoke, the yeah. blanket of smoke that's yeah. been across the province. And to say that the Stampede returned to normal, I mean... 
amidst a haze. So any photos that were taken, you could see. Well, sure, but that has nothing to do with COVID, right? And no, there have been to, hazy but, Calgary stampedes for 100 years. I'll push back on that. I don't know if there's been hate like. Oh, come on. Wildfire. Wild. This has nothing to do with. We're talking about two separate things, aren't we? I'm I'm just saying like return to normal. It's like what is you can, I don't know. I just we can say yes as far as COVID is concerned. We've gone back. Uh, <laughs> some folks have gone back to normal. Um, but I would I would say that uh, we're ignoring something a massive thing that's happening. Uh, yeah. At the same time. Okay. I. Because I'm just I'm looking at the the headlines and whatnot and you know hurrah hurrah stampede. Great, but in in the midst of we are having the a massive wildfire season. Well, sure, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure I understand that. Uh, that's okay. It's Monday morning. We're finding our. St- I, I don't. I'm not sure I understand what wildfires have to do with the Calgary Stampede. I'm talking about COVID. I'm talking about the you know the nation having the world being shut down, Alberta being shut down, and the Stampede signifying kind of the reopening there. There have been wildfires every single summer. Um, but some- not to this. Not to this extent. And well, not- sure. And I'm not discounting. I'm not discounting that we're going to cover wildfires we have covered wildfires but i'm not sure i don't think that that has anything to do with the calgary stampede i, I just think that we can't say that hey it's it's like everything's back to normal sure we're, we're great everything is great and it's like meanwhile you know yeah sure yeah there's I mean, that's a, a reality there's there are air quality warnings edmonton had 10 it was max on the weekend for yeah. air quality so i just i don't think that we can say you know turn a blind eye and put our heads in the sand that there are really dire. I mean, look at Germany with the the flooding that happened. Yeah, that's the worst it's been since the, like the worst uh, circumstances since the 1960s. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, we got we got we got a lot going on. Uh, I mean, <laughs> the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Great. You, you can know? tell where my head was yeah. this weekend. Yeah, yeah. Ah. super positive. Yeah, <laughs> super positive. I am an optimist. Okay, good. Well, you actually are. Uh, <laughs> I do know this to be true. Um, in just a minute, we're going to get to our expert guest. Looking forward to the conversation. Uh, first, I wanted to remind you, of course, that, that this show doesn't happen without the, the support of our amazing sponsors. And one of them is the team at Campers Village. And I, I was just taking a look at their uh, website, campers-village.com. You can link to it off our website or the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. I love this. It's It's picnic season. And so they've got you all set up and ready to go here with all of the gear you need, including that Yeti cooler. I was raving about the Yeti cooler the other day, and everybody was sharing their own Yeti stories with me. Everybody wants to prove how well the Yeti works, right? One guy said, oh, you you left ice in there for a week? Says, we use it for food. People, you know, some people for drinks. Do you have a drink and food cooler? Do you separate them? Two different coolers? No. Oh, you got to do that. You got to do that because your food cooler, it's got to stay cold you open it only when you absolutely need to the drink cooler is getting opened all the time right, right? right every what three or four minutes every three or four minutes the drink Pound. cooler is getting open Pound. you gotta preserve the ice nothing does it better than yeti it's the best gear for right here but campers village has everything hiking shorts and tents and sandals and flashlights and headlamps and all of the cool stuff whether you're car camping backcountry camping fishing or whatever they've got you covered at campers village.com Let's get to this story. This is a this is a, a, a really a troubling one, uh, and it's an interesting one. You know, when you talk about disease and you realize that some diseases have the potential to cross over, I will acknowledge we are all members of the animal kingdom. But when you talk about animals, you don't typically think of humans, do you? When diseases can cross over back and forth, it really captures the attention of everybody for obvious reasons. And new research uh, coming up, uh, about to be published, it's brand new, shows that chronic wasting disease is on the rise and could affect humans. Dr. Herman Schitzel is a veterinary scientist. He's the scientific director of the Prion Virology Animal Facility and head of the Calgary Prion Research Unit at the University of Calgary. Grateful to have you here, doctor. A good morning to you, and thanks for... Thanks for joining us on Real Talk. Good morning, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. This this chronic wasting disease. My understanding of it, I'm going to be honest with you, is, is relatively limited. It's uh, my understanding is it affects ungulates. Is that right? I mean, are we talking and, and, and what is it? Deer and moose. What do we know about chronic wasting disease? 
Yeah, that's the problem. Many people don't really know what this is. So it, it's an infectious disease, which is really, really spreading. And it destroys the brains of angulate, uh, of cervides, which are mule deer, wilder deer, elk, and in Europe, reindeer. So it's a strictly deadly disease. <clears throat> And it, it really, there's a lot of infectivity going into the environment. So it's very hard to deal with this type of disease. How long has this been an issue? I mean, what, how, how long has this been on the radar of, of scientists like yourself? Well, this disease is part of a bigger family of diseases, which we call prion diseases. And we find them in different species. And one example is met cow disease, BSE, everybody knows. So chronic wasting disease is around since the late 60s, 70s. It was first identified in Wyoming and Colorado. And the people there realized uh, that this is a part of this family of prion diseases. So it was spreading there. And then over time, we find it now in 25 or 26 states in the US. So it's widely spread in the US. Uh, we find it in, in Scandinavia, where it showed up actually five years ago. It was exported to South Korea. It showed up in the 90s in Canada, first in Saskatchewan. It showed up in around 2002 in Alberta. And since then, it's spreading. So what is uh, very typical for this, uh, what, what is characteristic for this disease is you have it in captive animals. You know, there are game farms, there's breeders of deer and elk, and you have it in wild living animals. In fact, it's the only prion disease, that's how we call this type of diseases, which you have in free ranging animals. And of course, free ranging animals are very, very difficult to, to control and, and to contain this type of disease. Do we know how it spreads? We have a pretty good picture how it spreads. So there are two main components. One is directly from animal to animal, and it's like a typical infectious disease. You have infectivity in saliva, and, and so when the animals are very close, we think there's a direct contamination or transfer of infectivity. So Actually, the more important and more complicated route of transmission is the environment. So there's a lot of infectivity going into urine, into feces. This goes into the environment. There are dead carcasses. It's a strictly deadly disease. Every animal infected is dying. Uh, and so, and the, the second uh, route of transmission is more the indirect one, where you have it in the environment, it stays the infectious for many years, and new incoming deer actually, actually when they are feeding there, and so they can get infected. So we, we know pretty much how it, the infection goes. So the real difference to, let's say, COVID-19 is, so COVID takes one week, two weeks, then you see somebody is sick. In, in chronic wasting disease, this takes around two, three, sometimes more years. And there's a time you don't see anything from outside and then they develop symptoms. It takes about months and then they die. So it's uh, the time frame is very different. Are we b before we get on to this new research, uh, doctor, and, and the implications for humans, uh, which is obviously huge uh, when it comes to the implications for the animals affected here i mean ultimately are we talking uh, you're not you're not gonna fix this in, in a sense you're not gonna heal these animals i guess is what i mean is it, is it i mean are we talking about mass calls here is that how you solve this uh <clears throat> no i don't think so i mean this is discussed now and, and and that's a huge issue but first let's see how the disease develops so it's really exploding now in alberta a few years ago, we had numbers, and numbers actually means hunter kills and tested heads. They were below a percent, uh, one or two percent. Now, in mule deer, they are between 15 and 18 percent. Wild tail deer is above five percent. So there's a huge expansion going on. So it's going north, it's going west. 
Banff probably already is reached. So this is not something which you can easily contain, right? So you need, you need a bunch of different measures and many, many stake and right holders aligned to really deal with this. So saying now we cull now in certain hunting areas and all is fine is like saying we solve the COVID uh, pandemics by staying three weeks at home. So mm. this might have an effect. There will be a delay, but this alone will not solve the problems. And by the way, it was tried before and was not very successful. Can you tell us about that, about the measures that were taken and why you think maybe they didn't work? Yeah, well, what many jurisdictions, and this is mainly in the U.S., did that they, they had a targeted strategy, which mainly was sharpshooting. So they thought, well, it's mostly the male deers, a certain age segment. You see behavioral changes, as the name says, they are losing weight. Well, let's kill the infected one. And this reduces actually the how many infectives you had over time. It didn't work really. So it was not very successful because the disease is too complicated. You know, we have this environmental load, which is there for a long time. So it, it's it's not so easy. There's a, there are other examples. So in when they had the problem in, in Scandinavia, it was with reindeer. They killed the entire reindeer herd there. And now they are waiting and they will repopulate them with reindeer later. So, and we are talking about a number of, of more than 2,000 animals here. So many people believe this will not work. So, you know, you can discuss it. It will help. It will certainly delay. But first of all, you also have to know where the infection is. And we have a problem there. We don't sometimes really know where the infection is because the monitoring, the surveillance is very limited. And depending on the jurisdiction, it's a very... You have a lot of fragmentation and we have we have areas we don't look at all. For example, in national parks and provincial parks, there's not a lot of testing and, and the same in the reservations. So the First Nations are not testing this. So and you need everybody really to solve this problem. So this new research uh, soon to be published, I mean, sounds to me like there are pretty serious human implications. What are we learning or what's new here with regards to transmission to humans? So what's new is the question whether chronic wasting disease can infect humans. So the real example we have to talk about here is mad cow disease, BSE, and a new form of human diseases. You know, this happened. So BSE jumped into humans and it were, we are talking about a few hundred cases we know of, but the economic implications were huge as we all remember. Trade, in part, uh, you know, BSE in Alberta, everybody understands this. So the medical system, the public health system, how you do surgeries, from whom you take blood donation and so on. It was huge, huge implications for the medical system and for other system. And the question here is, can this happen with chronic wasting disease? And, you know, a single case might actually trigger this negative cascade. So it's really an important question. Can chronic wasting disease infect humans? And of course, the risk increases, the more chronic wasting disease you have out there, the higher the risk it can infect humans. We are eating this. So the estimates are that more than 10,000 animals, which are clearly infected and infectious, are eaten in the United States and Canada. So this happens. So we are eating inf infectivity. You know, that, that's a general theme in infectious diseases. So that's what we call zoonotic diseases. Many diseases jump at us and usually they they are not able to really infect us in a way that they can spread from a human being to the next human being. And you know, there are examples like HIV coming from apes, or now SARS coronavirus one and two, they learned how to do this. So the question really is, can CWD, CWD has access to us. It can actually come in our bodies, but is it able to establish an infectious disease? And is it a disease which actually can go from human being to human being? And maybe it's a disease we even don't see. 
And then again, we have this long incubation time, which could be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, they wrote down until we see, oh my God, somebody was infected here. So this is where our research was coming in. So we tried to study this using the best available model, which is non-human primates. And these are actually macaque monkeys. So this is a study we started about 15 years ago with many groups. So we infected them and focusing a lot on feeding them infected CWD material from, from uh, coming from, from muscle, so venison and muscle tissue. And then actually we monitored the monkeys and we had to euthanize them at a certain time. So this was roughly going eight to 10 years in the macaques, which is a very short time. And then we actually looked at all the materials and we asked the question, did the monkeys get sick? Is there infectivity in the monkeys? So what kind of infectivity is this? And what we found is actually there was infectivity. The monkeys got infected, they produced prions. We can, and we didn't really see a typical prion disease in the monkeys, which is very dangerous because you might miss it. And then we put it into other animal models. This is what we do in our field. And depending on the animal model, we had no disease, but infectivity, we had a little bit disease and infectivity, and we had a normal disease and infectivity. So the infectivity was there all the time. And at the end, we sometimes had infectivity in spots nobody looks for in the prion disease. And now you have to translate this to the human situation. Would we see a human being infected with chronic wasting disease? First of all, there is already a human disease, which we call CJD or Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease. It's a very rare disease, but we have roughly 30 to 40 people dying every year in Canada because of this human disease. So if chronic wasting disease jumps into human, we, we should be able to discriminate it from the normal disease. And you know, BSE only was found because it was so different in human beings. So people realized this is something new. So chronic wasting disease from our data, which we have from this macaque and uh, subsequent animal studies actually indicate we would not see the disease. We would look at the wrong things. We would not do the correct diagnosis. And that's now the real risk. So we have to be very aware on the human side not to miss something here. And of course, we have to reduce chronic wasting disease because that's the main risk factor here. Okay, so we, we can talk in a moment about what, what human symptoms might look like or what you think the effects might be. But but is it is it safe to suggest that if 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 the evidence shows that chronic wasting disease is on the rise uh, in populations including deer, uh, elk, moose, and there are humans hunting these animals and eating them, and chronic wasting disease or the human equivalent could take years to show up. Uh, is it safe to assume that there are people right now uh, that are walking around, uh, for lack of a better word, infected? Well, at least they are exposed. Whether they are productively infected, we cannot say, and there are no data. So our study just says it's likely it can jump into humans. Whether it ever did and made an infection in humans, we don't know. And what the future will bring, we only can predict. So I, I cannot really answer this. But everything sounded pretty negative so far. We have to say there are measures in place which actually protect hunters and their family. So in many jurisdictions, we do testing. In, in, for example, in Alberta, when, when, when the authorities know actually we have chronic wasting disease, they usually say it's mandatory or it's voluntary to test the head. So they take out a piece of the brain, it goes into a lab, and then they do a test which shows there is infectivity, yes or no. So it's not the perfect test, but a very good test. So it's very important to do this testing because it makes sure, I mean, that people have to know until they have a negative test result. And if the people adhere to this, actually, it, it kind of makes sure that not a lot of infectivity is going into human consumption. So that's extremely good because when you have a positive tested deer or elk, 
you shouldn't eat it. So that's very important. So we have measures in place which actually protect, and it's the same in the captive uh, area. So there are measures in place that infectivity should not go into human consumption. But this system is leaky. And depending where you are, it's voluntary or no testing. And the other problem is, in peak times during the hunting season, it takes quite some time until you get your test result. And we all know that some people just don't wait. So it's a tricky, it's, it's a tricky situation. <clears throat> Ultimately, how does this all play out, do you think? I mean, 10 years from now, are you looking at a, at a, at a population where 20% or 25% of whitetail are affected and, 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 and the province uh, or provinces across the country have to pull hunting licenses or have to stop issuing tags and, and people, I mean, how, like what would be an extreme if, if, if humans can't get a handle on this, ultimately what happens? Yeah. So, I mean, we can now talk about the impact on the cervide population, deer, elk, and so, and they are very bad. So we know from studies, when you have more than 20 to up to 25% positive rates, it's very bad for the population. Actually, we did a study where we could say, actually, it's about a 20% reduction every year in the survey population when you are above 25%. So that's a huge stressor for the population. And I mean, it's not the only one, of course, there are others. So it's not good for the survey population. I mean, the survey population, you know, that's biology. They, they are countermeasures. They start the breeding earlier and the reproduction and such thing, but it's very bad. The other thing is, and this is now specific for Canada, caribou are at risk. We already have regions where the habitats overlap between infected deer and so and caribou. So it will go into caribou, they are susceptible, and this will be a major problem. And caribou are again used as consumption for northern communities, for First Nation communities. So we are talking here about a population problem in cervides, which translate into a food security and food safety problem for certain parts of the population. I mean, they need this for their for their food supply and so. So that's that's actually a huge problem. Then the second thing actually is could a CWD go into other species which we eat? And there was a lot of attention, of course, in cattle. So far, the situation seems to be that it doesn't jump into cattle when, when they have to eat it. You can experimentally infect cattle. So, but the prions we have, they change, you know, they're almost like viruses. They change their behavior, also they are protein, and there's a kind of selection going on. It's a very slow one, but we have a dynamic situation here. And the more we have out, the, the, the more likely it is that we are running into a variant like with COVID, where you constantly see it changes and so, and you have new things out, which learns to infect other species. Pigs, you can infect orally, and oral is the real root, which is of concern. You know, there are wild boars out, and so they probably feed on carcasses of, of that deer and egg. So it's a complicated situation. And then the third population scenario is the human side. And we already talked a lot about the human side. So I don't think we will have hundreds of thousands of infected people here, but it's a long-term problem. We might not see the problem. And even as I said, one case makes a lot of negative implications which will cost a lot of money and which will really very negatively interfere with our medical system, our blood donation system, our exports. You know, even now Norway is not uh, buying hay coming from Alberta because they say we have CWD here. And there are other entities which are important for trading. Do so, you, you, sorry to interrupt, uh, doctor. I, that's an interesting point there. I happen to know my cousin who's a producer, a dairy farmer, and obviously grows crops as well, uh, was telling me he's he's uh, one of the ways that he's been able to sort of make it through COVID and, and, and ride out some of the uh, the challenges that farmers have faced is he's he's shipping alfalfa <clears throat> to Korea. 
and uh, and and he was telling me that this has been something that's allowed him to explore a new revenue stream. Does it make sense when you say that Norway's not accepting uh, crops from Alberta right now because of chronic wasting disease? Is there science? But would that be a scientifically supported position that Norway is taking? No, that's not science. That's politics. You know, mm. that's trade politics. So what the people in Norway try to do is to tell their population, their look. We take care a little bit for you. I mean, they already have it, so it, it's ridiculous, right? And and hay is not the commodity where you expect a lot of infectivity. You know, we have some in some data which show that prions even can go into plants, but I, I don't think don't think this is a trade issue. You know, you know, remember BSE a lot when the United States closed the borders, when Asian countries closed the borders. It's what not all science. There's a lot of politics there, and that's very complex. You know, I'm not an expert in this, but trades and trade policies sounds very complicated to me. <clears throat> well, I, for context, by the way, you may be interested to know that when you, you brought up blood donations a couple of times, I'm, I still cannot donate blood. Uh, I went to college for a year in England in, in 95, 96, right? When, uh, you know, I mean, not, what was it? No, it was like BSE, but it was, it was kind of a different reality over there. It seemed just, I, I don't know, Britain experienced, real problems uh through that era and if you check now i mean this is like 20 years later whatever it is more than 20 years later uh, people like me that lived there uh still cannot donate blood and it's always something you know some people would probably argue doctor that that you know maybe there is evidence that i have had some sort of neurological problem uh yeah. but, but but i would say that that it's always something although i've always felt healthy and good and always been very positive it is always in the back of my mind it's always in the back of my mind you you walk with it yeah i, I do not want to scare you but there are some epidemiological data coming from studies which say that a certain part of the uk english population is actually infected and yeah. they talk between one to two thousand one to twenty thousand whether whether such people ever develop the disease we don't know but it's it's you could say it's a little bit of a ticking time bomb. And, you know, the, the real issue is you have to make sure that such people are not infecting other people. And that's the blood donation issue, because actually it happened. A few blood donations were coming from such people before they actually got sick, but they were infected and their blood was infectious and the blood donation infected other people. You know, you, you start a cascade and then it's not in the, talking about weeks here. You look into things which take many years to 20 years, 30 years down. So it, it's complicated. That's why I always say we have to be very concerned what we do now. There are long-term implications down the road, which are 10 years, 20 years away from us. So we have to be concerned now because later we might not be able to fix such things. I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this question, Doc, but but if, if there are, you know, people that are listening to this podcast or watching this show right now saying, listen, I've been, you know, proudly hunting and feeding my family, filling our freezer for years. We eat a ton of deer meat. We eat a ton of moose. Uh, it's sort of how we how we feed our family in, in, in a healthy way, you know, cons, you know, obviously aware that this is some of the best meat, some of the healthiest meat that you're going to possibly gain access to. But now they're, you know, sitting there thinking, what, what do these neurodegenerative conditions look like in humans? What sort of symptoms should I be looking out for? I mean, it, could, could you give people a heads up on what, uh, you know, symptoms might look like in yeah. human beings here? <clears throat> So the disease really destroys the brain. And this is what you see in human beings. It's a little bit like an Alzheimer disease, which takes 10 years in Alzheimer. Now you reduce it to months. Yeah, usually people have some symptoms and it's usually coordination, uh, behavior. And so you're different. It, it, it's realized it's something neurologic. People go to the doctor, the doctor says, go to the hospital. And then actually most people are really dying within three months to six months in the, for the typical human disease, which has nothing to do with, with BSE or chronic wasting disease here. So the normal human disease, 
it's a long incubation time when, when people develop the symptoms and there's a kind of a spectrum of, of, of symptoms, they really die. And, you know, some people might remember Kuru in Papua New Guinea, which was coming from cannibalism. There are a few pictures out how the people were dying. So the real terrible thing here is everybody is dying because we have no therapy, we have no vaccine at the moment. So you really have to make sure people are not exposed at the large extent. But on the other side, it's a very rare disease, right? So what we have in humans is extremely rare. What we have in cattle was not rare. What we have sometimes in cervide, it's not rare anymore. And we have to make sure that we are concerned about these things, that we really work on the containment side and we need many stakeholders here around and that we do our job. And there's, a, there's the job we do in Alberta and Canada is a pretty good one, right? We are in a good position, but we have to to increase our efforts here. And it's very important that people understand this is a potential risk. What's it like for a, for a guy like you to, to, to spend 15 years working on something and, and finally glean data that you can publish? I mean, that's, you know, to some people that would characterize their life's work. Yeah, so it, it's not my study, right? So it, it's a team study where we had six, eight teams and so and people providing the money. I mean, you cannot do research without money. So money is always an issue. So what you usually are not doing, you're not going public public before you at least have submitted a, 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 a manuscript for peer review. So we actually went public a little bit earlier because we think it's important. And, but now, you know, I'm a, I'm a typical scientist. I'm very cautious usually. I have a European background. I don't say, well, now we say it's like this. So we really took it very, very serious. And it took myself years to get convinced. This is really something. So many things are not black and white. So what our study cannot answer is how, how on, on the qualitative level, how often will this happen? We just say it can happen, right? And, 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 and now we, I am absolutely convinced this study will be published in a good journal and so, and, and quite frankly, we have a second independent study, which is not using the macaque system which comes up with the same data. And this study is also going to be submitted very soon. So there will be two independent lines of evidence, which pretty much have the same outcome, telling it's a possibility, we have to take it serious, and we have to study better how this in humans could look like. Fascinating stuff. Is, is there adequate government funding on this provincially, federally, I mean, do you, I, I would imagine researchers will always say they could use more, but but do you believe that the different levels of government are taking this type of thing seriously? Yeah, you know, what should I say now? I mean, frankly, I feel we are pretty well funded. In particular in Alberta, there was an Alberta pre and Research Institute still in place, and they actually were the main funding agency for this very, very expensive primate study. So we are getting funding all over, including from the United States and so, and where we have a really good push right now is in the vaccine development, a vaccine against chronic wasting disease. So now many organizations and so even NGOs actually, conservation agencies and so, and ministries and chief scientists, all of a sudden they really push for making a vaccine which we can use in the wildlife, a vaccine which we can give to our wild living deer and elk and so, and I think it's a realistic goal. And I must say, I'm, I'm pretty happy how serious they take it now. I, I could say you five years ago, nobody was interested in this, but it was actually COVID which changed this. All of a sudden, vaccines are a good thing. I, I mean, at least for part of the population and part of the funding agencies, you know, they saw what vaccines can do good and so, and now we, we have it also in our field, which is not the classical virus or bacterial disease that they say, well, 
you guys go for the vaccine, go aggressively for the vaccine. We need it in five years. We give you a decent amount of money and you go now and produce. And this is what we try to do now. Dr. City Slicker question here for you. I mean, how, how do you how do you vaccinate wild populations? Well, we don't know exactly, right? So we are still in the experimental part, finding out it, it works pretty well in our mouse models. We have done some studies in reindeer, but now we are doing a big study where we infect white tail, where we first vaccinate and then infect white tail deer. So this is all proof of concept. Then, then actually develop a vaccine which you can give in the wildlife. That's a huge challenge. And you need everybody here on board I talked about right holders and stakeholders. So there are different views, what you can do and what you should do. You know, and as a, we, we think about salt licks, feeding station and such things. So, I mean, they have to eat it. There's no way around. So, and then we probably have to do it in a targeted way that we create buffer zones where we, inf where we, vaccinate the animals which are close to an area where it might actually spread in. We cannot vaccinate the entire deer population in Alberta. That's not realistic. So we have to come up with strategies which are more on, on a smaller level and together with other things because the vaccine again alone, like the shooting or the culling is not the solution. You need different things together and we need the wildlife biologist. But I think it's an important thing, but quite frankly, we don't know exactly how to apply the vaccine. Because people might say, when you bring together the animals, you even increase the risk to infecting them. So again, like always with vaccine, there are pros, there are cons. But I would say we are on the right way. Fascinating stuff. This is this is really neat, uh, Doctor. We're grateful that uh, first of all, I mean, do, do you say congratulations to researchers? I think you can say congratulations when you've come up with something that's pretty, pretty fascinating. It's relevant to people. It's going to resonate, but also we recognize that it's a pretty serious subject matter. And I know this this kind of thing uh, will sit with people as, as they try to process what it means for them and for their families. And for their outdoor pursuits, and we can make those decisions best, of course, when we have information like yours, data-driven conversation like this. We're grateful for your time. Thanks for this. Thanks so much, and thank you for having me. It was a great pleasure. You bet. That's Dr. Herman Schitzel, a veterinary scientist. He's head of the Calgary Prion Research Unit at the University of Calgary, scientific director of the Prion Virology Animal Facility. How about this from Donna? She says maybe the vaccine could be put into our garden plants because the deer are always eating gardens. That could be interesting. Fascinating stuff. Also slightly terrifying. <laughs> well, and I saw it. I wish I could remember the, the uh, audience member's name so I could credit them. But someone earlier said, uh, with everything going on right now, I'm not sure I need to be hearing about this. <laughs> and Fair enough. Well, it's true. I can only take it's kind so of how, much on. It, yeah. It's kind of how I perceived maybe that you were feeling earlier yeah about wh where you go well hang on a second like all hell's breaking loose over in this country and look what's happening in this country and look what's going on over there and and if you really you know like like people that tune into this show do i mean if you're the type of person that stays informed that stays on top of things that always mm -hmm. wants to know the latest that's trying to understand why things matter and how they apply to you or people you care about or the world around you then it's a heavy load to bear yeah it's why sometimes we'll Tell people, here's how you can make your dog a celebrity uh, because it's because it's a reminder that not everything has to be deadly serious all the time. But it also doesn't mean that we jam our heads into the sand and ignore information. And and this is a really fascinating story and one that we haven't seen a ton about. So nice job putting this together. And I'm grateful that the good doctor w was able to join us. You imagine vaccinating a wild animal population and the challenges that would come. But some some genius yeah. is going to figure out some brilliant way. Like Salt Lake. I he love said. that. Salt Lake. The Salt Lake like, idea is such a cool idea. <laughs> I absolutely love that one. I thought that was a really, really great idea. Yeah. So that's kind of the, the type of story that certainly we'll follow up on and we'll stay on top of. And if you have thoughts, I'd love to hear from hunters. You know, because I think that that's who this is really, you know, you, another example would be... Uh, I should have asked the doctor about this. Damn it. Uh, but whirling disease, right? And, and so a lot of Alberta lakes, whirling disease, right? Am I saying the right thing? I'm pretty sure. 
I've heard uh, of whirling disease, but I don't know trout, anything about disease, it. Whirling disease, trout. Yeah, whirling disease. So this is why, uh, let me just, just off the top of my head, I, I believe that whirling disease is caused by Myxobolus cerebrialis. Oh, um, really? Yeah, just off, I'm, just, I'm just recalling that off the top of my head. Um, it's, uh, if I remember correctly, it's a microscopic parasite that affects uh, salmonid fish like trout, salmon, and white fish. Uh, but in all seriousness, a lot of Alberta lakes, and I would imagine it, it may be the same in BC and Saskatchewan, Manitoba, maybe, I don't know. I only know this because we've hiked into lakes and found them to be closed. Um, signs up that people are not pulling fish out of there because of whirling disease. And it's absolutely prohibited fishing in those lakes, let alone eating the fish. Now, I don't know if there's evidence of whether or not whirling disease can affect human beings or not, but I would I would imagine in this conversation around Chronic wasting disease, CWD, and things like deer, elk, and moose, which mm. are prized, uh, you know, by hunters and of course people that enjoy, the, you know, venison or the, the wild meat. Um, where's your head at on this? Is this something that's been on your radar? Is this something that would impact? You know, I would imagine people will say, "Well, the good doctor pointed out that meat gets tested. That's an important thing." But what if you got some meat off the back of the truck? If you know what I mean. What, 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 what if somebody de- gifted you meat and you're not really sure? I mean, is that the type of thing that, you know, oh, Jasperson's trying to whip us up into fear and frenzy of whether or not we're going to eat that elk tenderloin? Um, not really, but I'm curious to know what it makes you think or where it takes your head, mm. you know, how you process that. The BSE thing, it's like I say, this is just my personal story. I would have, there's, there's millions of people that have the same story, but, you know, 25 years later, I still wonder. Yeah. Like, I'm probably fine, but Canadian Blood Services... Um, you know, first of all, they won't let any you know, gay men donate blood either. So, I mean, they have their own issues, but you know, they, 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 they're not convinced. They're not convinced that anybody that lived and ate meat in the UK 25 years ago can donate blood now. So I haven't been able to, so it, it, you walk with it. It's always in the back of your mind, always in the back of your mind. The team at park power, uh, from the very inception of this show has been powering our hashtag real talk RJ. It's what Sarah Hoyles keeps an eye on while we're on the air. It's a great way for you to interact with the show, to comment on our content, to let us know what you'd like to see. Park Power provides internet, electricity, and natural gas for people across the province of Alberta. And if you visit their website right now, parkpower.ca, you can compare rates to see how what you're paying now could differ from what you'd pay if you took your business over to them. And a reminder that if you use that promo code 2021-REALTALK, they're going to give you $70 off your first bill. Our friends at Friesen Brothers right now have a great promotion. This is barbecue season, and they've got their brand new Friesen Brothers branded barbecue sauces. Tried it out this weekend. Threw, Threw some unbelievable beef burgers on the grill. Tried out the Friesen Brothers barbecue sauces. Phenomenal. Of course, threw them in the fresh baked buns out of the Friesen Brothers famed bakery. But here's why it matters most to you right this minute, my friends. You see that Instagram post we're showing you? I want you to go check out Friesen Brothers on Instagram. You'll find them at Friesen Bros, B-R-O-S. We want you to like that post, the post about the barbecue sauce. Make sure you follow Friesen Brothers and follow me on Instagram and leave a comment on your favorite thing to throw on the grill. What, if you were shopping at Friesen Brothers right now, what's the one thing you'd buy to throw on your grill? Just leave a comment on the Instagram post every day this week, including today. We're going to pick one lucky winner who's going to win a barbecue package from Friesen Brothers. Look at this thing. Fabulous. Absolutely fabulous sauces and a whole bunch of goodies in there. We're going to give away five of them this week, one every day to a lucky Real Talker for pickup at their new South Edmonton store. So swing in by the Friesen Brothers Instagram. You can find all the details there. They spell it out for you on the page. Well, this is an interesting angle. Uh, we're talking about COVID and we're talking about returning to work and we have a better understanding of maybe some of the health related implications of returning to work. Did you realize, did you know that women, as a matter of fact, encounter health challenges unique in the workplace? It's the subject, or at least the jumping off point, of a new book, Bent Out of Shape, Shame, Solidarity, and Women's Bodies at Work. It's been published this year in 2021. The author, Dr. Karen Messing, a women's occupational health expert, kind enough to join us on the show this morning. Good morning, doctor, and welcome to Real Talk. 
Good morning. Thank you for making time for us. What what prompted this book? What prompted Bent Out of Shape? Well, so many things. Uh, I guess the reason I wrote it right now was that I was struck by the Me Too movement, thinking about myself, as I often do, and thinking about how I'm I've been shamed in my in the, over my life uh, about my body and how many other people are shamed about their bodies and how that is a particular issue for women and particularly for women in the workplace when in jobs where we use our physical bodies and we are exposed to various risks. So I, I, I wrote it to get rid of my own shame and to make women or to make women, I, to help women, I guess, they're hoping to help women to be prouder of themselves in the workplace. I don't know if that's probably not very clear. Um, we, ha- we have a, a kind of a forced choice in the workplace between insisting on our own differences and insisting on having our specificity recognized and just trying to merge with the flow and pretend we're just like all the other guys and not asking for special attention. So there's kind of a, a playoff between our need for equality and our protection of our own health. And that's what I was trying to show in the book is that if we pretend to be guys, it's not going to work for us. Can you, can you give us a couple examples, hypothetical or otherwise, of what body shaming aimed at women in the workplace might look like? How, how, what, give us a couple scenarios or examples. Sure. Um, the, I've done a lot of observations in the workplace. Now, I'm an ergonomist, so I go into workplaces and I watch people work for a long time. And then I ask them about the things I don't understand. So when I go into a workplace, for example, where women, and I'm thinking of, of communications technicians, we did a study of communications technicians, we went into that workplace and we looked at how the women were working and we noticed that the tools that they were using were not appropriate for them. The handles were too big. They had to carry very heavy ladders and there wasn't a point to it. There's no reason why your ladder has to be 50 feet long. But when we asked the women if they had any special problems, at the beginning, they were very silent. They said, no, 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 we're, we have no problems. That are, uh, we can do everything the guys do. So why were they having two to three times as many accidents at work as the men? And that's because that's what we also saw. We saw that in the figures. Well, they were having a lot of accidents with ladders, and the ladders were too big. So we said, well, why don't you ask for shorter ladders? Well, we asked for shorter ladders, but the foreman just laughed at me. So why didn't you complain? Well, I don't, I don't want to complain. I haven't been here very long. I'm kind of afraid that, of what they're going to think of me if I complain and if I'm always asking for special treatment. But see, it's not special treatment when you need something that's appropriate for your own body size when you've only had women in the job for a very short time, so nothing's right for you. I don't know if that's a clear example. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and you know what? And it, you know what? I it sort of prompts me to imagine what 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 the hypothetical response might be, which is an old school one, right? Which would be people simply saying, "Well, it's not a woman's work." Or this is a man's work, or that's a blue job. It's not a pink job. I mean, do you see? Has society evolved from that? Not a lot. No, I mean, I think you're right. And that is such a that is the reaction that not only the men have around them, but the women have themselves. Who say, "Well, I got to show that I can do this just like a man." And maybe you can do it just as well as a man, but maybe you don't have to do it just like a man. Maybe you need something different in your environment. And we have a, a perfect example where a woman was one of three women in a workplace with 1,200 men. They were uh, working on machines and they were putting machines, big, big uh, diesel engines together. And the height of the w- where the engines were was just all wrong for the women. And uh, again, their tools were, were not appropriate. So for example, they spent a lot of time tightening bolts and they had a a tool to tighten the bolts, and the tool was too short. It meant that you 
didn't have the mechanical advantage that you would have if it was longer. So if you try and push really, really hard to tighten the bolt, and you're a woman, maybe you need your angle to be a little bit longer. You need your tool to be a little bit longer. So we got the tools changed, and the woman became much faster than the man that she was partnering with at the, tightening the bolts. And all she needed was a bit of a longer arm on her tools. And it changed from being, I can't do the job and I'm getting pain in my arm, to I could do this better than the guy I'm working with. So it's little changes. It's thinking about it. It's not being afraid to ask the changes. Hmm. Um, I've got an interesting comment here from one of our audience members by the name of Heidi, who says she says I've I've, I've recently seen a discussion, women talking about desk chairs at work and and how they're all designed around a man's body type and they can create ergonomic issues for women. And Heidi says, I wonder if this may be why I sit curled up in a ball at my desk. Is that a thing? I mean, this is something I, this probably has not been on most people's radar. The most striking example I have of that is um, if you've ever stayed in a hotel, they have the chambermaid, the, the cleaning staff have these carts that you push around with all those cleaning solutions and they push them from room to room and they have to push them on these very thick carp- carpets. So it, it's, it's an effort. And we couldn't figure out why the women had the, the bars on the carts were way over their uh, comfortable pushing place. And so we went and looked up the specifications for the carts, and they were designed for 70% of the shoulder height of the average Euro- European male. And if you can find me a European male who's pushing those carts in a hotel, I will give you a free night stay in the hotel because... There has never been a European man pushing one of those carts. So, yes, chairs, t- desks, uh, in a car, car seats. Uh, you, you have those little models that are used to test uh, car crashes. Right, crash test you dummies, a, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, test dummies, thank you very much. And those dummies are all male dummies. So when women are in car crashes, they have a higher risk of dying. Uh, it's it's just it's not nobody's doing this being bad or nasty they're just not thinking and and the thing about it is for for women is we have to name these things we have to object to them huh uh are there industries i mean you've studied my understanding is you've taken a look at many different occupations uh technicians people working in communications you just mentioned hotel workers and cleaners um hospital personnel support i mean obviously you've you've seen so much are there industries or companies or nations uh, that are more good than guilty? I mean, are some industries aware of this, and are they impacting change in a positive sense? Well, one, uh, one example I have, uh, I'm not sure it's typical, is we're now doing a study with counselors in uh, shelters for women subject to conscious or violence. So uh, women who are in a refuge, and we're working with the people at those shelters to try and determine, among other things, how can we work out work schedules? Because the um, this is a, a job where you really need to be available whenever the thing is happening. So you really need people on at nights and evenings, on weekends. Uh, and this is a terrible problem for the women workers. They're all women. Uh, because they all have families and they have family obligations. And schedule design in general in our society has been done, work schedule design has been done in regard to the typical male pattern of 1950s where uh, people didn't have to worry about their families because they had a wife at home that was, was doing the worrying. But now both women and men really do need stable work schedules that they can predict. And this is not always the case. I mean, we study many stores and, and industries where you get your schedule just a couple of hours even before it begins. This is, a, this is an impossible task of re- reconciling your work schedule with uh, your, your human needs, if you like. Uh, and in the, work, in the women's shelters, what we discovered was that Unlike all the other jobs that we had studied, 
the women and the supervisors were working out ways that everybody could be considered when the schedules were being designed and that the schedules would be flexible and that it would be easy to change schedules with somebody if you had to and that the information that you need when you change your schedule would be available to you. And they, it's that they had to want to do it and they had to think it was important and they had to think women's needs were important and not just the women's needs that were the clients but the women's needs who were the counselors. And to state so the- yes, there's goodwill. There's a way. Yeah, and to state the obvious, Doc, I mean, you know, you're talking about, you know, you, you have to want to, I suppose, uh, reflect uh, the importance of and, and the equality of women in the in the workforce. But it's not also just the women that are currently in the workforce. You, you have to set the table or pay for more women in the workforce, right? I mean, a lot of these changes can can be reflective now of what your current employees need, but a lot of it might be how you attract and re- retain uh, skilled female workers in future. Absolutely. I think that's a very important thing to say. I'm thinking of, the, uh, of a retail store outlet that we studied where there was incredible turnover, which is not good for a business. So they, did, they had more than 100% of their workforce turning over every year. And what we noticed was that the women who worked there were outside the age range where people had children because the schedules were so awful. So uh, what we had was women under 25 or women over 50. And so if you want to attract women who are really more stable because they're going to be not moving around so much because they're not going to be uh, changing their minds so much, then you will have to get that, that group that are in between 25 and 50, and you'll do that if you have some kind of decent way of making your work schedule. Yeah. And if you listen to your workers and what they're saying. So, yes, you have that. Absolutely. Yeah. I love this comment from Joan, who's watching us live on YouTube this morning. She says, as a five-foot-tall woman living with a six-foot-four man, we both have our issues. I wonder, Joan's probably pretty comfortable when they fly, uh, you know, in economy class on an airplane. I don't know about the man she's living with, but then maybe he's more comfortable or maybe less susceptible to injury in a motor vehicle accident. I thought it was really fascinating when you talk about the the design of the crash test dummy and then the disproportionate number of injuries that women sustain on average uh, when it comes to motor vehicle accidents. Do you see other evidence along those lines in workplaces i mean if you're just tuning in by the way we're talking to dr karen messing a professor emerita of ergonomics at the university of quebec at montreal do we see long-term impacts on women's health um in in things outside of of obviously gross injuries for example or or blunt force trauma what about things that would develop over time yeah uh we are always impressed by the fact that men have a risk in in men's jobs there's a a risk of injury, of dramatic injury. And I don't want to belittle that. I I think it's important that men be protected from falling off scaffolding. Uh, These are tragic events. We've had one recently in Canada. Uh, Men are also more likely to be exposed to corrosive chemicals that look and smell dangerous. Uh, They're more likely to be exposed to tremendous levels of, of noise at work. Uh, these are dramatic exposures, and a lot of the energy of people in the occupational health field is devoted to preventing them, and that's as it should be. However, there are many exposures to which women are more subject than men, and one of them is musculoskeletal disorders. That's like tendonitis, uh, epicondylitis, uh, backache uh, in the upper regions of the body. Women are one and a half times more likely than men to have work-related musculoskeletal disorders. And why is that? It's because we're spending a lot of time doing fine, work, tremendously repetitive movements in awkward positions. Um, my pet example is why do uh, grocery cash register clerks, why are they standing up? Why do they stand all day? It gives them um, backaches. It gives them, makes their legs swell. It gives them problems with varicose veins. Uh, It's extremely uncomfortable. It's hard to uh, keep your hands moving in the right ways and to to manipulate all the weights that they have to manipulate. So why are they doing this? And if you ask 
people who own the grocery store, they'll tell you that the, the public won't tolerate uh, women sitting down and serving them. But if that's true, how come in almost every other country in the world, women cashiers are sitting? Is that right? So it's a useless exposure that causes health problems. And it's only due to You know what, though, it's Karen. You you t- you talk about you know the public doesn't like to perceive or doesn't like to see a woman sitting while they. And it, it sort of sounds to me like you know this is this is the guy that's you know uh, you know walking through the grocery store with a lit cigarette and a glass of whiskey in his hand with his you know nineteen fifty four Studebaker parked outside. <laughs> doesn't like to see the women sitting. Uh, but you look at how we've reinvented how people work. People sit on exercise balls now. People stand at work and have standing workstations. People are working from home. People are working off hours. People are more customizing their schedules. I mean, is this, do you see this as as sort of a societal attitude in transition in the context of what we're talking about that could include things like allowing grocery clerks to sit? I wish I could say I saw transition in attitudes toward working women. Um, I of course, there's been a huge transition in the idea that women work. When, when I started working 100 years ago, uh, there, were, there were practically no women scientists. A lot of people objected to my being uh, in a laboratory. That, that we've, we've done away with. We've, we've uh, accepted the fact that women work. And we can even respect some of the work that women do, although... We're not. We're still not paying. We're still paying women ten to twenty percent less than men. I mean, should just get that in. Um, is there uh, less stereotyping of jobs in the workplace? Are we making progress about that? I don't know. I, I don't know what it's like in Alberta. Uh, I know uh, that in, in Quebec, uh, we're still underpaying women workers. Particularly, we saw this in the COVID crisis. Uh, there's a tremendous, tremendous uh, loss of the health workforce, and part of that is due to under underpaying the workforce. Part of it is due, a lot of it is due to the lack of respect that we give to these people, um, lack of respect in the sense that we switch them around all over the place and treat them as if they were interchangeable and not members of the team. Uh, there's a lot of the COVID-exposed workforce that was not given proper equipment. So there's a lack of respect that is kind of pervasive when we deal with women workers. And even though at the same time there was this discourse that we uh, we treat them as angels and they're guardian guardian angels, uh, at the same time they were they were being asked to work under tremendously dangerous, uncomfortable, and uh, in difficult uh, conditions. Well, I'm, I'm happy to tell you that everything's absolutely fine here in Alberta, doctor, and we have absolutely nothing to worry about with regards to how our nurses and teachers are being treated right now. Everything is perfectly fine. Has the uh, has has COVID? It's it's actually no laughing matter. Obviously, we laugh so we don't cry sometimes. But uh, has COVID nineteen? Uh, you know, we we as we we emerge from this pandemic, still a thing, but we we like to f- feel at least like we're on the back nine. So to speak, did, were, were you struck um, in any sense? Was there a profound? I mean, did you have these moments where you went, "Gosh, there's a there's a direct application here from COVID nineteen to this area of study"? Did it influence even how you wrote your book? Uh, no, because I almost finished the book when mm. when we started having the crisis, uh, so it didn't influence me directly. But certainly during the COVID crisis, which I'm happy to talk about. Uh, in the past tense, even though who knows, um, I, I became very upset by how, uh, particularly hotel cleaners, uh, hotel hospital cleaners, were being treated, how they were being ignored, how they were being disrespected. Because these were, if you look at, at serum levels of virus, expo- serum, serum uh, indicators of virus exposure, the cleaners are more exposed than doctors. For example, they're exposed about the same as those people that work at a patient's bedside. Why? Because they're in the rooms all the time. They they come. Uh, they deal with a lot of the excreta and so forth. So these are people who are quite exposed, and yet we never saw anything about them in any of the 
language about our saviors and our guardian angels and their work schedules, their pay were totally unaffected. Sometimes people were trying to be nice to the uh, personal support workers who were at the patient's bed bedside, all no, um, not nice enough in my book. But anyway, they were trying to be nice. But nobody even thought about the, the hospital cleaning. Hmm. What would you say would be the one thing that you'd like? I mean, obviously, I think that employees may take something different from reading your book or hearing you here on Real Talk as opposed to employers, uh, which is great because everyone can impact, you know, their, their own surroundings or, or apply this to their own lives. But, but what would you say you'd like people to take from reading your book or what would you like to, you know, what further conversation would you hope to prompt? Well, I'm glad you said further conversation because I think that that's the first thing to do is that I think that we women workers have to speak to each other, have to share, um, uh, let's take a, a subject that everybody goes yucky about, uh, menopause and menstruation. These are women-specific problems that can be affected by the work environment. Uh, when your work environment is too cold or too hot, it can affect your, your menopausal symptoms. It can affect your degree of pain around menstruation. We don't a whole lot talk about those things at work. We aren't comfortable talking about things at work, and men tend to go, yeah, when they hear conversations at work. So we go off and have those conversations somewhere else. But but I think it's important for women in general to talk to one another about the problems we're having, about the, when we feel a lack of respect, when we feel that we have um, needs that are not being met when we're having a th something we think is an individual problem and we at the time when I'm thinking it, I'm do must be doing something wrong because my arm hurts that's when it has to I have to go and speak to the woman next to me and see if her arm hurts too or see what she's feeling or see how she is is seeing my situation because maybe she'll see something I didn't and getting together and making requests of of the employer making requests of your colleagues, uh, making getting together with your colleagues, trying to get more stable work teams. Uh, all these things can, can help you to transform your workplace into a place where you feel more comfortable and more more normal, and where women are, are normal. Dr. Karen Messing is a professor emerita of ergonomics at the University of Quebec at Montreal. Uh, her new book, Bent Out of Shape, Shame, Solidarity, and Women's Bodies at Work can be purchased anywhere you buy great books. Doctor, thank you so much for making time for us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Fascinating stuff. <laughs> it's so validating to hear, you know, there be research on it and to be like, oh, so it wasn't just me. Oh, that's not just me. I'm not just difficult. Can I'm, I put you on the spot? Have absolutely. You, have, have you, I'm not talking, in the, well, maybe, maybe in this workplace. But in this workplace or others, mm. have you noticed, would you say, um, like, gender specific? I, I always get, just to be honest, to be real for a second, yeah, I get squirmy. nervous yeah. about the, using the right terminology because, like, is it gender or is it not? But gender specific challenges or gender related challenges in workplaces, have you experienced that yourself? Well, I, I think the thermostat example is just, like, so bang on. Yeah. Uh, there was one workplace where, well, multiple newsrooms that I've worked in that are just freezing. And, you know, I would ask if maybe, potentially, could we maybe, and the facilities guy, the operations guy, one guy who approached and he was like, bah! Yeah. It's it's fine. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, the good news for you here is that it's a cool day in the studio and it's 26 degrees <laughs> Celsius. <laughs> and so. I've noticed I'm like got a wool <laughs> sweater on, which usually it's really and I I love how warm it gets in here. I love it. Um but I just that that piece about you don't want to be a bother. Yes. You don't want to be seen as a, a a complainer and you know oh that's Sarah. She's always complaining. So it's, it's you know, put up and shut up. Um, she used that example of the of the, the, the woman that was turning wrenches, whatever that job yeah. was. And anybody that's that's done any work on, on cars or anything knows that, like, torque wrenches and, and or pry bars or anything, uh, length matters. 
<laughs> length matters and uh get and the th- leverage that's, right that's like one example of you know you could have somebody that would be an absolute star employee with regards to productivity numbers etc quality mm. um, but if they're not given the right tools to succeed they won't succeed did you notice that moment you see that uh comment from penny on our live chat i dropped in on the live chat quickly during the interview penny says she just discovered why her mother-in-law had to have three surgeries on the same hip Penny says they determined the prosthetic at the time. Uh, so in other words, who knows how many years ago, but the, the, the prosthesis that she was wearing was built or they were designed for men and that she was too small for even a small man's size. Now, I don't know. I would imagine, I mean, that the technology around prosthetics these days and everything are, are really amazing and incredible. Not to say that the problems have been solved. I wouldn't know. But that's there. There's one more example of something mm. you may not think about if it's not if it's not designed for that person, right? Fascinating stuff. Yeah. Talk about the grocery workers. That's a yeah. They, it, they don't like them to be sitting down. I always feel like grocery workers should make about eighty dollars an hour. Uh, you think of like first of all, they're experts in customer service. They're the front facing ones. How was your time? Did you find everything you needed? Big smile on their face. But also, like, don't be too chatty. Because the line's going to back up. Yeah. And then they're scanning everything through. And you ever watch? I remember as a kid watching, you know, people at the grocery stores we would go to. And they'd, they'd be like, you know, uh, organic spinach, 4461. They'd punch in the code. They like memorize f- Field them. strawberries, uh, cantaloupes, honeydew melons. You know, you're going uh, like, is that always something that's impressed you? That is something that's always impressed me. I, I'm actually thinking about a story my mom told me is that when she was in university, she like bagged groceries as her side job. And this is when there were no barcode scanners. Yeah. And all the workers had to learn to read Braille so that they could just type with one hand and not lose their focus. Jeez. And then you mentioned the bagging, like gone are the days of, of uh, like, I think, you know, dedicated cashier and bagger or whatever the, you know, probably you're called like customer service associates or something. Uh, but the the cashiers are doing it now, so they're also experts in Jenga. Jenga, you know, always like fascinating I, stuff. I love watching it. Like, wow, look how the, yeah. ooh, they yeah. keep the eggs out. They wait till the eggs go on top, and then they'll always ask you the. They'll say, like, "Do you mind if we put the meat in with the laundry detergent?" Oh yeah, you know, maybe that's a terrible example, actually, but yeah, it's always impressive stuff. And then she mentions the hotel carts. Yes, yes, that's one area of my life where I've I have I will just go on record and say like. I am a thief. I am like unabashedly a thief because I don't think because I think when you're when you're paying to stay, it's maybe not actually thievery. You know, the extra I'm getting judgy eyes right now through this plexiglass. (laughs) You know, what we need to get is like the plexiglass. Like what are those? um, What are those auto adjusting lenses that you can get for your glasses when the when like the sun comes out and then I can just impose shade across the plexiglass. As I impose shade on you. Impose shade on the plexiglass right now. You telling me you've never walked past a, a hotel cart and helped yourself to an extra shampoo or an extra thing of mouthwash? I I haven't. Never have. But but. I will say that if it's in my hotel room, I also feel like they kind of invite it in that like they have a little salt because you're like, well, they obviously expect us to take it because well, it's in a little small. They're not they're not they don't refill them. Yeah. Like once you use one little tiny little bit, once you unwrap that bar of soap and use it once, it's done. Yeah. Right. And then but then some of the hotels you stay in the fancier hotels and they've got like a Veda shampoo or something. And you're you're like, like, I uh, am scooping up. Yoink. Yeah, that was one of my that was one of my uh, sort of um, not hoarder collector tendencies back in the day was was <laughs> hotel shampoos. And I would have I had like an entire bag of them. So what changed? Because, well, because I realized that you never use them. I had visions when I was you know, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old of one day having my own place and I would have visitors. And when the visitors would come, they would go into the guest bathroom and I would have towels laid out for them with all the different accoutrements. Uh, including, you know, you'd probably have lotion and shampoo and give them the real hotel experience, right. you know, and then much like the hotel when they left, then I would, I would, I would, you know, get rid of those specific items and, and, and circle in or cycle in new ones that had also been lifted from hotels in past days. Would you curse them when they stole your? No, that's why they were there. <laughs> okay, okay. And this is where you would realize that it's actually not thievery. It's actually just convenience. Whatever you need to tell yourself. Whatever you need to tell yourself. Just so thoughtful. And, you know. How about this from Carrie, who's watching you? And she says, uh, I collect all those samples and give them to some of the inner city social agencies. Yeah, me too, Carrie. Yep. (laughs) Great idea. 
That is a great idea, isn't it? Haas says, I always take the hotel shampoo. I paid for it with my bill. Absolutely. Scott says, in your imagination, you would have a guest bathroom. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Guest room, guest bathroom, guest quarters. That is... This is not my reality. That is so cute. But yeah. you're like, as your 19-year-old Jess Bo, you're like, oh, yeah. I'm going to... The thing that I saw a guy doing, um, was it on whatever social media platform, he actually has uh, started stocking menstrual products at his house. So yeah. if his, uh, any like friends, uh, women, uh, friends or like relatives come over, that he actually has them stocked. He's a single guy stocking that at his house, which there I was like... Go whoa there you go yeah absolutely i was always big on like i grew up surrounded by hospitality you know my one grandma my grandma norma norma jesperson was like this like champion of hospitality right we grew up i've told you this i mean my whole family the family dinner table at, at stan and norma's house 6 11 38th avenue southwest calgary i mean that was where all the magic happened um right down beautiful right on the elbow river just off sifton boulevard oh my gosh take me back but there would be, I was telling you, this like family Christmas celebrations. We'd have, my, my grandpa's Jewish friend would be there t- talking to us about Hanukkah. Or we would have, like after they'd, you know, in the Sunday, in the foyer after church, they'd, my grandpa would go and find like people that were new. You know, they're new, you're new here. Why don't you come over and come to our house for lunch? And there'd always be new people around the table and always meeting people. And I learned hospitality from them and my understanding of it. So when I moved away to university, I wanted to kind of replicate that. So I'd have the boys that were like 20, right? Of the boys over to my townhouse and you buy the ham that was already done from the groceries was already all you got to do is warm it up slather some honey over the top of it you know and then you know put some pineapple slices i'm talking like this is like 1980s inspiration but for these guys that would otherwise be getting chicken mcnuggets it was kind of a big deal hospitality was always prioritized and it's amazing to see the examples of people that come before you in life that you know Meantime, James is just trying to rain on everybody's parade on the live chat. He says, you realize that like stickers on the fruit and veggies tell the cashiers what it is, right? James, that's a very cynical interpretation of these, of how, how, how remarkable the memories on these cashiers are. Yeah, they also I s- leave the stickers off a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, and I don't, yeah, you don't always see stickers on them, but yeah, some of them do. Some little clues. My sister was a cashier in junior high or high school at the local grocery store. And yeah, that was one of like when she first got the job, she had to sit down and memorize all the codes. So just in case they didn't always have the sticker. Yeah. Yulian says, OMG, Ryan, my paternal grandparents were Stan and Norma too. What? Are we cousins? (laughs) That's the logical place to go with that. That's the logical place to go with that, isn't that? (laughs) Oh my gosh, you are the forgotten cousin. That's incredible. I saw my pal Courtney Terrio yesterday said your hot girl summer nickname is your grandmother's first name and the last thing you ate. And so I determined that my hot girl summer nickname is Norma Benedict, Hmm. which I thought was very fancy. Somebody said to me, that that is straight out of Downton Abbey. Yes. Very well done. Friends, it's no secret that running a small business is not easy. Life as a business owner is hectic, to say the least. Let Alberta Blue Cross help you find a little peace of mind with a group benefit plan. They offer flexible health, dental, life, and disability coverage for your employees. Even better, you can let your employees enroll and manage their coverage at any time on any device. It makes life easier for them. It makes life easier for you. Alberta Blue Cross. Explore your options at ab.bluecross.ca. This studio is powered by the team at Westworld Computers. They've got us set up with the gear that we need. And when we run into trouble, we know that they are just one step away. It's all part of their commitment to service. It's why we're proud to partner with them. You can check them out online at westworld.ca. You can see their brand new lineup. The IMAX that everybody's talking about. Is it time to upgrade your gear? If so, keep in mind their technicians will transfer over all the data on your old unit to your brand new one at no charge. It's part of what you get working with an independent family-owned business like Westworld at westworld.ca. Also, a big shout out to the team at Eden Landscaping. Perfect time of year to start envisioning. You know, you realize what your dream could look like put into reality. Right side to the backyard, and you're going, we're just missing the mark right now. We could do so much more with one of those beautiful fitted patio stone, those, the, you know, the, the areas where whether you're going to have campfires out there, 
or whether you want to put out a couple of lounger chairs or, or, or maybe you just want to create a space for the kids to play, landscapeedmonton.ca, your source to see what Eden Landscaping has been doing, bringing outdoor spaces to life for more than 20 years. We got a ton of emails uh, over the last couple of days after an announcement over the weekend that the Alberta government had partnered uh, in a new forest management agreement with Crow's Nest Forest Products. And so per this release from the Alberta government, uh, the Honorable Devin Dreeshin, Alberta's Minister of Ag and Forestry, the deal means $32 million, they say, to the province in timber dues, holding and protection charge payments, uh, about a quarter million dollars, $225 million to Alberta's GDP over the next 20 years, call it $10 million bucks a year. They say it also means reliable, well-paying jobs for hundreds of hardworking Albertans. It's certainly raised the ire, I think, of many people who are comparing this to what they saw with regards to coal mining in the eastern slopes. Uh, Kevin Van Tiggum, former superintendent of Banff National Park, I saw him on, on his Facebook page writing, Out of the blue, the Kenny government has announced the de facto privatization of forests in the headwaters of the Old Man River. Kevin goes on to say the entire C5 forest area is part of of a new agreement issued to Crow's Nest Forest Products, binding contractual transfers to private sector companies. This is the former superintendent of Banff National Park. That means citizens now have to deal with a logging company, not government, if you have concerns about the where, when, and how much of clear cutting. Van Tegum, a contributor to Alberta Views magazine, says if it's the first you've heard of it, same here. It's the UCP way under Premier Jason Kenney. Ignore the public while cutting sweet deals with corporate interests. Sort of the same way they tried to do with coal, only this time they got it done before we found out. We want to encourage you to CC talk at ryanjesperson.com on the emails that you may send to your elected officials. That's exactly what Annette and Janelle did. And I wanted to read their emails today to give you a sense of where some Albertans are at on this. If you disagree with them, we welcome your emails too. Uh, you know, Annette wrote an email to the Honorable Grant Hunter, who's her MLA in Tabor Warner, says it was quietly posted over the weekend. The government signed this new forest management agreement with a 20 year term with Crow's Nest Forest Products. The government just handed a thirty five hundred square kilometer plot to a private company to harvest as it wishes. How was the decision made? to choose the company, what checks and balances are in place, what guarantees to people in southern Alberta have that environmental protections, including water protections, are in place and will be monitored. Water is such a big part of this conversation. It's a logging conversation, but water is a huge part of it. Annette goes on to wonder what consequences would there be for noncompliance? Why wasn't this made public before it was signed? Why was there no consultation with Albertans? And why is the new agreement not detailed on the Alberta government's website so I can read it? Annette says to her MLA, as my elected representative, can you please tell me what you are doing to ensure that all Albertans are heard, not just ones that the government's signing contracts with? What are you doing to ensure that due process and transparency happens. It appears to me to be an under-the-table deal. And I look forward to hearing back from you. That from Annette in Foremost, Alberta. Shout out to Foremost this morning. Janelle wrote in out of Red Deer, Alberta. She wrote to the Premier, the Environment Minister, to her MLA in Red Deer South, to the Energy Minister, to the Opposition, and to us. She says, Premier, it came to my attention today that your next move to decimate the environment now that Grassy Mountain has been rejected is to essentially allow private companies full control of logging in the Old Man River headwater region. Have you looked outside your window today, Premier? Have you seen the smoke clouding our skies from the wildfires in B.C.? Do you understand what's happening with our climate? Record high temperatures, minimal moisture, rapidly reaching drought conditions. Our forests are under threat. Farmers' crops are in jeopardy. Forests, critical, of course, to water supply, let alone forests in headwater regions. Alberta is now allowing privatization of forests in the headwaters of the Old Man River. The entire C5 forest area now part of this new forestry management agreement. It means citizens will deal with logging companies, not government, per Kevin Van Tegum. I'm sure the logging companies will listen to the average citizen when we have concerns. 
Janelle says, you've cut Albertans off at the ankles. So now what? These haphazard decisions will have gross repercussions for generations to come. This is inappropriate use of power, and I demand an explanation. My children deserve an explanation with regards to what's happening to the future in this great province. That from Janelle writing in, in Red Deer. Those are just two examples. Now, if you work in forestry, if you worked in logging, I'd love to hear from you. If you live in this part of the province, always curious for your take on this. And you can send us an email anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. That's what many of you did as well, by the way, with Positive Reflections, which is coming up in just a moment. There are a lot of other things going on right now, too, though. When you take a look at what's in the news right now, the drought and the smoke and the wildfires and COVID and everything going on, it starts to feel a little bit heavy, doesn't it? And we want to make sure that people feel like there's an outlet. And so we encourage your feedback across the board on all kinds of things. Every once in a while, someone will write into us and say, I'm not sure if this would be of interest to you, or I don't really even know the relevance, but this to us feels like the forum where we can participate in conversations that matter to us. And we really want to reiterate, Sarah, you and I, how much that can drive our editorial process. Mm. There are so many things going on. I mean, for us to understand where this audience is at, um, it's the people that take the time uh, to leave the comments, that, to interact with us based on our content, good and bad. I read an email from Karen the other day who was absolutely pissed off following my interview with Warren Kinsella, which is totally, totally fine. And I had some fun with her email, and then I got an email from somebody else that was pissed off about how I read Karen's email. And I thought, <laughs> that, that also is totally, totally fine. Because when we say the word real is key to this whole conversation, real mm -hmm. talk. And I know, that, I mean, every single day, I mean, how, you know, when, when it comes to the numbers of uh, the subject matter that we receive or, or, or the number of things that people are chiming in on, I mean, it's almost endless. Um, but it goes such a long way in, in, in the behind the scenes process of putting this show together. Absolutely. I mean, it's really people are very much active listening. They're very engaged. And so, yeah, we get suggestions around, you know, where can we go next? I mean, in the journalism term, it would be the follow. What is the follow? What is the story that follows this up? And uh, yeah, folks are also just the idea of, oh, have you heard of this person? And yeah. the number of times someone's made a suggestion of a guest and, oh, I... I'd never thought of that person. A podcast they heard, a book they yes. read, a, a TED talk they watched, mm -hmm. a conversation they had with their friends at the soccer field or on the golf course or whatever the case may be. We, we encourage and welcome your feedback anytime. You can, of course, just go straight to the website. That's a great source. Uh, if you're forgetting all the specific contact information, just go to ryanjesperson.com. You'll find the talk to us link right at the top of the page. Um, we are having some fun with our question of the week this week, and, and I wanted to point this one out. This was inspired uh, by uh, some of the content last week. Of course, Gary the Adventure Cat, one of the biggest celebrities to ever appear on the show. Um, not many of our guests have had 400,000 Instagram followers. Gary the Adventure Cat did. And then, of course, an amazing conversation about how to make your dog famous. If you miss those, these are, well, I mean, they are just fun. But at the same time, people are making ten grand a weekend with their celebrity pets. So maybe it's not all fun and games, but so much fun. It lightens the room a little mm -hmm. bit. It reminds us that there are wonderful things going on. And so if you go to RyanJesperson.com right now and you click on Question of the Week, it's right at the top of the page. We know it's a tough world out there. And to make it a little easier, we keep pets. These furry, feathered, and scaly counterparts are our companions. They round out our families. They provide us with joy and unconditional love, and they even shape us as people. So in this week's Get Real Question of the Week, we want to ask you about your pets and the impact they've had on your life. Oh, yeah, and by the way, whether or not you think your pet could be a social media superstar. So it takes just a couple of minutes to fill out at ryanjesperson.com. You just click on Question of the Week. It's presented by our official research and strategy partners at Y Station. And later this week, we'll be reviewing the results of our most recent question of the week and we so appreciate everybody that takes part in that i was talking to a guy yesterday uh lucky enough to be outside and he stopped me on the street i was walking my dog and he stopped me on the street to talk about the new grand wagoneer the jeep is releasing he wanted all the details he said my wife and i have a budget 
He said, we've been looking at the Cadillac Escalade, but what's the deal with this new Grand Wagoneer? And I said, my man, that's exactly what we're talking about. At St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge, they have the best selection of Jeeps in the province of Alberta. They share their inventories, which means whatever you're looking for, there's a good chance they have it. So you can start with the the smaller, more practical, let's call them the municipal they used to say puddle jumpers, but I don't think you, nobody wants their Jeep called the puddle jumper. But there's the economic options, right? And you move your way up to the Cherokee, the Grand Cherokee. The Grand Wagoneer is back as their entry, their re-entry to the luxury class. And if you check out St. Albert Dodge or Sherwood Dodge, you can link to them via the sponsors tab on our website. You'll be able to see the latest selection There's also that Wrangler 4xe, the electric Jeep Wrangler. I had a chance to drive it. Fascinating technology on that one. Go check out Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. If you're in the market for a Jeep trusted since 1941. I'm excited to let you know that I have a phone call with the teams at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park this week to determine what this month's special will be for Real Talkers. You know right now, if you go to the Dairy Queens at Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Y Gardens, or Baseline Road, you drop my name or the show's name, you're going to get two cheeseburgers for five bucks or two double cheeseburgers for seven. Plus, do we really have to tell you that Dairy Queen is the source for cool treats through the summer? If you're going to take your business to a Dairy Queen, we encourage you to take it to the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park and tell them that Jespo sent you. We're also looking forward to this week's edition of Trash Talk. I absolutely loved it on Friday. We did a politics-free trash talk, and it was so much fun. Sure, you can get angry at politicians, but what else is grinding your gears? We've got one sitting right now in the hopper ready to go for next Friday about the passing lane on highways. Uh Uh-huh. Somebody was all kinds of fired up, and they sent us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. The trash talk happens because the team at Local Waste loves to talk trash, and they'd love to earn your business. If you're locked in a bad contract with this company that sold you a big bin, but your business, your small business, just doesn't need it, Mikel and his team at Local Waste will get you out of that contract. You can find them online at localwaste.ca. We're also, of course, so proud to partner with the team at Kubi Energy, right? The team at Kubi Energy... They've been taking people to net zero or as close as humanly possible, installing solar systems across Western Canada. And their teams right now, based out of Kamloops, BC, and Edmonton, Alberta, are hard at work. You know, solar is more affordable now than ever before. The tech is better when it comes to storage and the like. Jake and his team at Kubi can help you get your solution figured out. You can get in touch with them today at kubienergy.ca. Every Monday, the team at Kubi Energy also gives us great reason for optimism. These are viewer and listener emails submitted to our website, our email inbox, part of a little something we call positive reflections. Details in just a second on how you can win a free solar install in your home or your place of business. But first, let's get to this from Melissa. Melissa, you filled our tank the other day. She said a quick note of thanks for everything that your team is doing on Real Talk. This past year, I was on maternity leave with my first son. Congratulations, Melissa. Says, needless to say, it wasn't exactly the maternity leave I had always dreamed of or hoped for. Especially during the winter months, it got quite lonely, not being able to meet up with other moms and have playdates together. Instead, while I played with my son at home, I'd turn on Real Talk, and it helped stimulate my mind. I learned new things daily. I love the diverse range of topics and views on every show. Every evening at the dinner table, I'd say to my husband, today on Jesperson, and, and then I'd relay whatever new thing I learned. Melissa says, engaging in this learning and listening on these very personable discussions help ease the loneliness, and I'll forever be grateful. Now it's summer. We're not in the house as much. Our munchkin is very active. We're getting into a new routine, but I wanted to take a second to let you know how significant this show and this community has been to our family, and a thank you for what you're doing. Melissa, that made our week. What about this one from Tanya, who wrote in to us to say, Hey, I wanted you to know, because of Real Talk, I knew about that St. Eugene Resort. 
You remember that one, the former residential school that's been transformed into a, a beautiful uh, hotel and golf course? Said the amazing work of former Chief Sophie Pierre and her community, something to behold. We were in Kimberley, B.C. last weekend visiting family, and we took a bike ride to go see the site for ourselves. What a mix of emotions to stand there and look at that building and imagine what happened there. And then to see the memorial statue the community has erected in front, reminding us of the determination of those children, despite the inflicted shame, to survive and to persevere. Thank you again for keeping conversations going and giving us real things to learn and reflect upon. Tanya, amazing. And guess who we heard from? We heard from Royden Mills. You remember last week's Positive Reflections, the sculptor who had the big installation at the dog park? Well, turns out, it sounds like a whole bunch of you were in touch with him. And he wrote in to say what a kind thing that audience member Scott did to engage with you, sending positive energy my way. I was really touched and encouraged. I'm recovering from surgery and doing well and so grateful for this effort to lift my spirits. It really, really did. He went on to say, by the way, I've known Scott since he was 12, playing on a peewee hockey team I coached. Says, I coached him for four years. He was a terrific leader. His enthusiasm for life is remarkable. He took time off work to come and lend energy to that group of people volunteering to help install my sculpture at Terwilliger Park. He went on to say, I've been luckier than most, thanks to the faith and encouragement friends and neighbors have for my artistic efforts. Thank you so much. From Royden Mills, Sculptor. Real Talk, Positive Reflections, courtesy Kubi Energy, bringing people together, and we love it. It doesn't stop here, friends. If you go to kubienergy.ca slash realtalk right now, you'll find details on how you can enter to win a free solar install we're going to get one person's home or office or cottage or cabin or whatever as close to net zero as humanly possible all you have to do is send us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com explaining why your solar story is the most compelling one we'll hear we've got a bunch of submissions already but the cutoff isn't until the 25th that means you again have one more week to get your story in. We're then going to put the three top stories in front of the real talk audience and somebody's going to win big. We're estimating the value of the prize to be about $15,000. Might be a bit more, might be a little bit less. It depends on your specific scenario because this is a custom solar install. No strings attached, no cost to you. We've got some photos. We've got some poems. We've got a couple videos that have been very well done. You have just under one week left to enter. Encourage you to do so at kubienergy.ca slash realtalk for all the details. Great show in in store tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Sarah Hoyles is hard at work. We're going to keep that learning and the real talking going. Thanks for making today part of your routine, and we'll talk to you soon.